Welcome everybody to this webinar from Internews' Earth Journalism Network. We're very pleased you can join us today. We have a, a, an interesting topic lined up for you on climate change in, uh, in the COVID altered world. What is the current status of climate change as we face the pandemic and, and how can we address it in, in these uh, turbulent times? Um, there's been some discussion of that in the press. Of course, a lot of the media coverage these days is focused on the pandemic and political situations going on around the world, but um, we're very pleased today to be able to focus on climate change for, uh, and we're, we're very glad you can join us as well. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna be joined today by two very special guests. We're pleased to have them with us. Rachel Kite is the Dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University and formerly the Chief Climate Officer at the World Bank. And Justin Moreland is with us from Time Magazine where he's the Energy and Environment Correspondent. correspondent. Thanks very much to both of you for joining us. Before I turn it over to both of you for your opening remarks, just uh, a few words uh, of introduction. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, the Earth Journalism Network is a global community of over 12,000 journalists from more than 180 countries who are dedicated to covering climate and environmental issues. We're a project of Internews, the global media development uh, organization. And this is one of a series of webinars we've been holding on various topics over the last couple of months, including quite a few webinars on zoonotic diseases, and the impact of uh, enviro environmental degradation, of wildlife trafficking and other issues and how they relate to the epidemic that we're, we're, we're facing. Um, this webinar is gonna last for one hour uh, and we very much want you in the audience to ask questions. This is a great opportunity for you to ask questions from our two distinguished experts. When you do so, please use the Q&A feature that you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So we know there's a chat uh, feature as well, but we're asking you to please enter your questions, type them into the Q&A feature. We'll be able to consolidate them there, curate them, and ask them of the, the presenters. And we might even be able to answer them uh, online. So please make a note of that, and please do ask questions. We definitely encourage you to, uh, to raise your questions. Um, this is really a, a great opportunity, we hope, for you to ask. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our guest speakers. We'll start with Rachel Kite, just for a few opening remarks and your thoughts on where we are today in terms of climate change and our efforts to address them. Rachel? Hi, well, thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Um, it's great uh, to be with uh, all of you through Internews, and it's always a privilege to be alongside Justin Warland, one of my uh, favorite <laughs> journalists on this beat. Uh, he's broken some really big stories in the last year. Um, so I think we have to think about uh, COVID-19 and the climate crises as, as compound crises. Um, they um, uh, share many uh, features. Um, obviously, um, uh, the origin of a zoonotic disease uh, is um, intertwined with the story of uh, uh, humanity's encroachment into nature in a way that is unprecedented in the planet's history, um, bringing us into proximity with uh, pathogens that uh, are in the wild. And so there is a whole question about uh, how we interact with nature. And of course, that interaction with nature is a very big part of um, the uh, increase in uh, mitigation, the increase in emissions, and obviously a very big, will be a very big part of our resilience to climate change, the extent to which we can change the way in which we manage land and resources uh, in, in order to be more sustainable going forward. So we've, we've got one point of connection there. The second point of connection, I think, is that both COVID and climate uh, can be thought of as respiratory crises. Uh, obviously, uh, the impacts of COVID on uh, the respiratory system of, of uh, us as a species, uh, but also what we were doing uh, to our own respiratory health as a result of climate change has become a bigger and bigger focus of understanding why we need urgent action. 
Um, and of course, we know that if you are compromised uh, because you're living in a highly polluted city, uh, if you are exposed to bad air, then your resilience to COVID-19 is compromised as well. So again, we're interlinked or these uh, crises are interlaced in that way as well. And then thirdly, you know, as the impact of COVID-19 uh, hit in waves around the world. So we saw economic activity shift. We saw uh, a, a huge drop in energy demand uh, between 20 and 30 percent in different uh, jurisdictions around the world. And com coming with that then came a, a dip in emissions, not uh, correlated exactly. So we didn't see, we didn't see a 25, uh, 30 percent drop uh, in emissions. Uh, we saw a dip in emissions, and I think that that tells us something very important about what we need to be doing uh, as we have urgent and systematic climate action, hopefully, over the next decade or so, which is that while I can stop commuting on a daily basis um, and all of my colleagues do the same thing, uh, really, we have embedded in our economy uh, this, this deep carbonization at the moment. Uh, and it is really about the energy system, it is about manufacturing, it is about industry, it is about uh, uh, land use and agriculture. Th these are where emissions are actually embedded in our economy. And so individual action is important, but we really have to make systemic uh, deep decarbonization choices going forward. The last point I'll make then is we're now at a very, very critical juncture as we think about the terms of the recovery from the crisis. So, most economies have gone through emergency measures as the as the virus has hit. Um, people have chosen to do that in different ways. It's a very distinct approach in Europe as opposed to North America. You're starting to see the virus really bite down in some of the emerging markets as well. Africa is beginning to look more vulnerable as well at the moment. So we've come through the first relief phase, as it were, and now we're thinking about economic recovery. And so now the question is, how do you recover so that you actually speed up the transitions which were necessary in order to deeply decarbonize? This is the year when every country is supposed to be filing with the United Nations its nationally determined contribution, its climate plan, which should be more ambitious than before. Those plans are going to have to either be embedded in recovery plans or recovery and climate, uh, uh, climate plans have to be one and the same. Uh, and why, why is that? Well, because we, we have seen um, that, uh, well, we, we know that there are jobs in clean uh, energy futures. We know that we need to make a, a sort of increasingly a handbrake turn when it comes to the pathway of carbonization in the economy. Uh, we are now at a point where we understand that government has a very important role in stimulating private activity. We've got a lot of private sector entities looking for support from the state in order to be able to sustain their operations and continue on. And so now is a time where we could put some values around what kind of recovery we want. Uh, these are the time where we could uh, make sure that uh, shovel ready jobs are coming in green sectors. Uh, this is a time when we could actually uh, dictate the kind of transparency we want to see from private and public enterprises about what they will do with public money. And this is where government could put some guardrails up around the kinds of performance it wants to see uh, in terms of emissions trajectories. So if the European Union or European governments are prepared to say to airlines that look to be bailed out that the potentially in return for bailout money they would like to see a reduction in carbon emissions per passenger or per, per mile flown you know is that that seems to be a, a legitimate a use of public money because you're pursuing twin objectives one to get the economy going again two to get people back to work three to actually hit your decarbonization and resilience targets going forward so over the next few months it's going to be a critical moment of whether or not uh, our leaders and economic actors will be able to take the short term and the long term objectives, understand that they can be aligned and whether or not we will see recovery uh, that could put us uh, more closely on the trajectory we need to see for emissions reduction, build resilience into our economy or um, fail to seize the opportunity that comes out of this crisis. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Rachel. Justin, over to you, please. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And, um, you know, it's always challenging to follow Rachel, who is the real expert on this panel and somebody who I 
call with questions uh, all, all the time. But uh, you know, with that said, um, I'd start my remarks just going a little bit before you know six months ago, uh, before all of this, uh, before the pandemic unfolded, and look going into 2020 as a year that was meant to be a huge year for climate action. Uh, you know, ending with the Glasgow, uh, Glasgow COP, but before that, a series of key meetings, summits, all of which were designed to build momentum and the countries were uh, supposed to come up with new plans that would uh, reduce emissions. And, you know, 2020, with that in mind, was going to be a landmark year. Uh, I think we're in this interesting position with when the pandemic came about, where we thought, well, is that going to happen? Um, most of those uh, summits have been postponed, um, but yet we are in this position, and this goes to what Rachel is saying, where uh, we, uh, 2020 is likely to be a key year. Uh, in one direction or another, it, it's, it's too early to say, but it's likely to be a key year. And there are many different w reasons for this, but there are two things that I'll highlight. One is uh, really just about uh, sort of a, a mindset and an understanding. I think certainly writing about climate in the US, people are often um, um, skeptical, not necessarily of the science, but of the implications of the science and what will it actually mean for my daily life. It's very hard to understand uh, what, what climate change means, even if I'm writing about it, if I'm describing it to a reader. But uh, the coronavirus pandemic and everything that has sort of come out of that has, I think, led to uh, some degree of a mindset shift for people particularly people in power uh, in the US, um, or I should say people with privilege in the US, uh, things have been relatively stable for the past several decades. And the coronavirus pandemic has shown that natural forces, something outside of our control, really has the ability to grind the economy to a halt, to change the way we live. And similarly, uh, when I talk about climate change doing that, people all of a sudden, have a different understanding of you know, that sort of possibility. And so I think that's a very important mindset shift. The other, uh, the second point I'll make is really along the lines of, of what Rachel was saying. Uh, we, we have a, uh, uh, you know, an economy at a, at a standstill across the globe and countries, international, international financial institutions are going to be spending trillions, perhaps tens of trillions of dollars to recover. And uh, given the way that the science and the, the timing lines up, uh, those trillions of dollars are going to set us on an emissions trajectory for the next, uh, for years, for, for decades. And you know, those decisions are going to be made in the next year, the next two years. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a really, it, it's very much a, an uphill climb, uh, you know, the UNEP report, the UN Environmental Program report says we need to reduce emissions about seven and a half percent every year for the next decade. Uh, that's around the uh, fall of emissions, CO2 emissions this year. Uh, and you know, I think everybody, uh, you know, it, it's different, but everybody would acknowledge this year has not been a pleasant uh, year. So it's a, it's very much an uphill battle. Uh, the conversations are ongoing. Um, if you look around the world, you do a survey of, of different countries. The conversation in China versus the US versus the EU, they're all in very different places. Um, you know, but at the same time, there is an element of optimism. There is a possibility that places uh, you know, outside of the US, at least under this president, might actually commit to green stimulus that can uh, change, change our trajectory, but it's still um, to, to be seen, which is all to say, we are at a very critical moment. I think it's important, you know, as a journalist to underscore how this moment is so critical, um, particularly because it's easy, um, you know, we're in the US in particular, things are completely awry right now, but it's important to keep talking about climate because this, this moment is going to shape, you know, the decades uh, to come. So that's, those are my opening remarks and looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you, Justin. Thank to both of you for those remarks. Um, I'm gonna start off with a few questions myself I, I've been curious about. So both of you remarked on the importance of stimulus measures that we're likely to see from governments all over the world. I, I agree with you, of course, that this is gonna be huge for determining our future uh, uh, emissions trajectory. I'm just 
I wonder if you go into a bit more detail about what you've heard from different parts, from different governments around the world. It sounds like the EU might be committing itself to some kind of green recovery. In the US, we're probably looking at a, a fight between Democrats and Republicans over the nature of the stimulus. And in China, I haven't heard a lot, except that there are still building coal plants. But we, you know, we, we have journalists here from many countries around the world and many Many of them, many of these governments will also be no doubt doing their own stimulus plans. If you have any recommendations for what these journalists should be looking at, I guess not just in terms of support for renewable energy, but how are they handling their fossil fuel sectors? Uh, you know, anything you've heard from, from about these stimulus plans or, or what you think journalists should be looking out for, that would be helpful. Well, just a couple of things from my side. I mean, first of all, so for the EU, the Green New Deal uh, and the recovery package are sort of being melded together. And the question will be the precise nature of the detail, the green strings that will be attached to, to bailouts uh, uh, of uh, public or semi-public enterprises or private firms. And then the extent to which they'll drive uh, even further the, the, the ambitions around energy efficiency, the clean energy transition, but also, you know, agriculture and other issues there. Obviously, they're going to be looking for, for job rich um, uh, uh, recovery, given the fact that, you know, Germany, France, et cetera, are all now in, in recession. Flipping over to China very briefly, the, the Congress is going on. Uh, we've seen some, it, it, there is a tussle going on clearly about exactly which direction they go and how hard they go. But we saw the, um, some very interesting uh, uh, clarification of what green bonds can be used for. Uh, with regard to energy projects, which would seem to be a victory sort of for the greener public intellectuals that are fighting in the space. But obviously, we're still concerned about uh, the, any new investment um, uh, in, in certain provinces around fossil fuels. Uh, go, go to India. India, all the way through this pandemic, um, struggling with the impact of the pandemic, but they've had a series of solar auctions which have been extremely successful and are achieving extraordinary prices, even in the middle of, uh, the, of COVID. And I think this is one of the big stories, right, which is that the energy, energy demand collapsed. And so you saw um, uh, energy investment uh, slow down, but energy uh, in, investment in renewable energy has proven to be much more resilient than investment in fossil fuel based in, in uh, uh, energy and so therefore especially for emerging markets uh, being able to attract investment is a critical because it, it sort of um, it went home at the, at the beginning of the crisis right capital is repatriated but the I, I think what's important is making sure that everybody who's supporting emerging markets sees that the resilience in the investment market is for investment in renewable energy there's still appetite to invest in renewable energy I think one big quite final point is that one of the big questions is that more than 95 countries have applied to the IMF for, for financial support uh, it is the bank of last resort Many of those countries are much more uh, reliant upon uh, fossil fuels um, than perhaps some of the countries in Europe. Uh, they uh, have state-owned oil, uh, state-owned energy companies. And there is a real sort of um, issue with the fact that that public money is going to go into the balance sheets of governments. So it'll be budgetary support. That budgetary support is going to be going out the door to support state-owned enterprises. And so despite the fact that uh, the IMF has signaled that climate change and, and, ability, and the inability to react to it is a macroeconomic risk, and while multilateral development banks are saying they don't want public money to be used on the carbon economy, they want it to be used to spur the energy transition, de facto we may have a situation where a lot of sort of international recovery and bailout money is going to end up uh, helping uh, just sustain the payrolls of state-owned energy companies. Maybe uh, there is a lot of work to be done there to help those state-owned companies start to make the transition more quickly as well. Whether it's green conditionality or not, uh, you know, people will call it different things and it can be done in different ways. But uh, we may have a, a strange situation where a number of emerging markets who more than anybody else, you know, need help in the transition, maybe, maybe uh, taking the money and using it 
you know, in, because of short term need in a way that doesn't help them make the transition any more smoothly. That was a very, very comprehensive answer. I, one thing I, two things I would add. Um, one, I think on China, it's interesting to look at, I mean, as, as Rachel said, there's a tussle going on inside. There's clearly a desire from some leadership for uh, some element of green uh, funding, but also perhaps they don't want to actually put up the money for it or don't have the money to put up for it. Um, yet, uh, I think what's important to note is this sort of difference between, this, it, China's an area where, a country where clearly the picture is going to be a little bit more complicated than just the clear cut, yes, it's green, or no, it's, it's, it's not. I mean, they're continuing to finance coal, uh, as, as you alluded to. Um, and uh, yet they're also continuing, regardless of this current crisis, to uh, build out uh, green, uh, a green, um, I want to say a green economy, but uh, to build clean energy uh, technology uh, for the future. I mean, they've committed $1.4 trillion to be spent over the course of the next five-year plan is a question, can they bring that funding forward? But the point being, it's going to be a complicated picture. So it's very difficult to parse out and say, you know, is, is this a, a, you know, a one or a zero? It's much likely to be somewhere in between. Um, the one other thing I would just say I, I find really interesting is what's going to happen to some of the uh, fossil fuel subsidies in some of the smaller countries, particularly with low oil prices, it's something we've already seen where uh, countries, uh, Costa Rica, uh, I, don't, I don't want to get it wrong, but that other countries as well have set floors to uh, gas prices when uh, oil prices were low. Uh, I'm very curious to see whether those continue as oil prices rise and as the immediate crisis abates. And so I think that is something interesting for people around the world to be, to be looking at for journalists. Great, thank you both. Um, Justin, as you remarked, this is also the year that was supposed to, we were supposed to have the uh, big climate summit, COP26 in Glasgow. And so this was also the year we were supposed to have countries uh, coming out with their, with their NDCs, with their nationally determined contributions, their, their plans going forward for uh, uh, improving their climate ambition for, for uh, reducing fossil fuel, get greenhouse gas emissions. Um, a lot of that has been delayed now, obviously with the COP itself being delayed a full year. So, but there have been a couple of NDCs released. I think Chile has released one. I'm wondering, I, I, do you have a sense of how those NDCs will tie into these stimulus plans? And about the, the, the delay for the, the COP26, were you surprised that was pushed back a full year? Was that was there some other option that could have been that could have gone forward, or was it pretty much inevitable uh, given all the, all that the world is facing in terms of COVID nineteen? Well, I'll, I'll I'll start briefly. I think in terms of the pushback, I it seems pretty clear. I mean, the way that COPs work is there's you know like any other diplomatic summit, there is a whole you know year longer really of of background work that happens to make it happen. And so, um, you know, initially when they pushed it back, they didn't set a, the exact date and it turned out now to be a year later. It's really not surprising to me. Um, I, I, you know, these take a lot of work and, and I think arguably more work uh, means a better outcome. I also think, you know, to your, to your first question, um, uh, NDCs are a reflection of, of uh, internal climate policy. So, uh, they have to be interwoven with stimulus, I mean, or whatever recovery um, uh, is, is happening in, inside countries, uh, and those will be reflected in, in NDCs. I mean, NDCs are in some ways just like a, a, a you know, a, a commitment to, to for future policy, but like a, a, a combination, a, a list of everything that they're doing within a country. So, so they're definitely intertwined. Um, I'm curious to see what Rachel says. Sorry, struggling with the unmute there. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Justin's point about the NDCs is spot on. And, you know, in the first iteration of NDCs at Paris, you know, some of them, some of them really were very valiant attempts to do that. 
some of them were sort of pretty standalone and uh, you know, and some of them were sort of written by consultants and sort of, I'm not sure how many people within any given country sort of, you know, really owned them. And so th this really is, this first iteration is a chance to really get it owned and get it integrated. Um, uh, and the, the clock on this is 2020, not COP26. So they have to be filed by the end of the year, even if COP26 has been put back a year. Putting it back a year, I think, I don't see what other option the government had. And also, there's some interesting commentary coming from some journalists now about, given that the UK is, you know, not managing its own COVID-19 crisis as well as uh, was hoped, um, I mean, just by the numbers, um, uh, this is a country which is really struggling. And, um, uh, you know, in a year's time, we, you know, immunity will be, at, we don't we don't know where right we, we're waiting for a virus uh, some countries are building up greater immunity within their populations and you're going to build you're going to bring thousands of negotiators together into a into a closed space right this is a high risk activity and i think this actually asks a really bigger question which some journalists might be interested in looking at which is where's where's the innovation in negotiation going to be the un at the moment is still sort of planning to and, and under huge pressure from negotiators, who, of course, some of them are almost professional. I mean, this is what they do. Uh, they travel around the world three or four times a year to negotiations, uh, which uh, in many cases they receive a stipend for. Um, you know, there's not a lot of sort of uh, the incumbency of this model means that there's not a lot of internal pressure to find a new way to negotiate in a world which is now scarred by COVID. And if you're a developing country, if you're coming from a, you know, from a Pacific Island and your finance ministry is only three people and, you know, participating in these uh, um, staged events is very difficult anyway. Is, is there a way to sort of tick multiple boxes? One, being able to negotiate during a time of a pandemic, making those negotiations a little bit easier for developing countries to participate in. I think most developing countries are afraid that if negotiations go online, that they will lose out somehow. But mm. does it have to be that way? I think there's a big exploration of, I mean, how are we going to hold general assemblies at the UN under COVID? I mean, so I think there's, there's room for some, uh, some uh, innovation there as well. I think. Great, thank you both. We have a question from one of our journalists from Bhutan, uh, who you know notes that given his country's uh, current state, um, that not many people there are actually aware about the climate crisis. Uh, so he's asking what probable story ideas should he pursue so that the public and government is informed? Justin, maybe you might have some thoughts on this if we're, for our, our journalists from developing countries or trying to make people and governments more aware in, in the, you know, during these times, what kind of story ideas uh, might these journalists pursue? It's a good question. Um, I mean, I think it's hard for me to say exactly in Bhutan, but I think generally speaking, um, uh, sorry, if they're, let the helicopter pass overhead. Uh, uh, generally speaking, the uh, stories that speak to local impact, um, you know, stories that will, give a sense of what's likely to happen on the ground um, for people uh, in your in your country are, are stories that I think are, are most resonant. Um, I think uh, oftentimes I try to use different vectors besides just talking about the um, you know the, the, the weather implications or, or the, the, the you know sea level rise um, and you know put it in, in different terms that might be more relevant to certain policymakers or certain um, people, and I, I shouldn't say more relevant, but that might catch their eye in a way that that is different. So maybe that's uh, in terms of economic uh, output, or maybe that's in terms of education. Um, finding different ways in which uh, the, you know this 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 issue intersects with um, the things that people are actually thinking about and caring about, rather than just talking about. Um, about weather, but it's, I'm sorry, I don't have specifics about Bhutan. Um, some good questions coming in now, so I'm gonna keep them going. Uh, here's one from Noma Bolani. Um, the, the Global South has been asking for financial and infrastructure support for climate change mitigation and adaptation from the Global North. 
now with economies in the developed world being hit and stimulus packages focused on their own socioeconomic needs, how does the Global South apply pressure to the developed world to ensure they play their part? Either of you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think there's two, two things going on. One is there's going to be huge pressure on development aid and uh, sort of concessional uh, finance uh, as, uh, as the OECD economies uh, go into recession and maybe worse in some cases. Uh, and there's already, uh, I think, some evidence that some of the development agencies and frankly, they pay for a lot of the adaptation and resilience work, as well as some of the uh, sort of green uh, greening of the economy work. You're starting to see sort of, or anecdotal and anecdotes certainly of aid agencies sort of ringing up saying, you know, you know that big grant we made you, have you spent it down yet? Can you spend it down slow, more slowly? And maybe we're taking a pause on future grants and things like that. So I think that there's going to be huge pressure on that. And then when it comes to climate finance, I think this is actually where if the UK and the Italians who are hosting the climate talks, um, this is where they could um, continue to push for the kinds of reforms we need in financing so that more public and private money flows into climate positive investment. Because just because the COP has been pushed back doesn't mean that there can't be an extraordinary amount of work being done on the financial uh, mechanisms, on the financial regulation, on the mainstreaming of green finance. And so I think that's an area where the developing countries should, should really keep the pressure up because I think that that's not dependent on the COP. And because there's so much structural discussion that has to come because of the recovery that is needed, you know, this is potentially a moment of sort of creative destruction. And Mark Carney, who is the Secretary General's advisor on climate and finance, is right in this sort of sweet spot. So now is the time for that big push, I think. Thank you, Rachel. Any thoughts, Justin, or? Uh, no, I, was, I don't have any. Okay. Uh, we, Rachel, we have another question to you from India, from Joydeep Gupta in India, who notes, he, he, he notes your comments about the renewable energy uh, development there, but he also noted that the government has given a huge boost to coal mining. Um, any sense as to why that's happening? And I guess we could also ask that about China too. I don't know if you have any insights, if either of you have any insights on that. Well, I think it's, in the, in the case of India, it's the, it, it, we're talking about regionally specific dynamics and the need to keep people employed and to keep things ticking along in China. It, you know, I think it's about, you know, the need to sort of, it, it's it's a trick from the past, right? You throw up a bunch of power plants and you throw up a bunch of infrastructure projects in order to stimulate the economy, stimulate, you know, maintain employment, et cetera. And so it's a tried and tested sort of uh, mechanism mm -hmm. and that it's now particularly short-sighted is where the tussle is in China. I think in India, it's even more interesting because the coal assets in, in, in India, um, you know, they, they, they are sitting uh, uh, in the, on the state banks of India, right? So they are publicly owned. Uh, private banks in India are not investing in coal, haven't done for years, and they've got no intention of doing it again because it's not a good investment. Mm -hmm. And so you actually have a structural problem for India, which is it's going to have what we would call a, you know, a long carbon tail risk in its public sector banking, and which at some point is going to become a financial risk as well. Um, so, yes, there's, there's good and bad. And I think that that struggle, that tussle that we talked about that's happening in, in, in China is happening in India as well. India also needs to see investment in the smartness of its grid. It has grid balancing issues uh, as it brings on more and more renewables. So, um, yeah, but, but coal's not a good investment on the numbers and it's not a good mm -hmm. investment for human health. Um, we have a question from... Nigeria. Interesting question here is that, you know, during COVID, we've seen a big drop in uh, emissions because of the drop in energy use and airports have been shut down, as an example. Do you, either of you see climate change in the near future being given the same kind of impetus, the same push from governments that governments have, channel, have, have, have 
pull together to try and curtail coronavirus. I guess the question is, will climate change ever be seen as a kind of in the same as the same dire crisis that would drive such a strong action as we've seen in for the pandemic? Well, I think it's interesting because it, you know, I think going into this year, it seemed like uh, climate was finally on the upswing in terms of the attention and the, the due that it was being given by government. And, you know, now we're in sort of a, a slew of different uh, crises. And, you know, it is somewhat difficult to imagine climate occupying that position again. But I think what's interesting about climate is that because it's uh, an issue that touches so many other things, really everything, um, it also can be a part of, of uh, you know, a whole bunch of individual different uh, issues, right? So if we talk about, you know, as we're talking about economic recovery and stimulus, we're talking about where does, what role does climate play? We're, we talk about, you know, protecting against future pandemics, what role does climate play? I mean, it, it's something that if it needs to get embedded um, in, in the way in which leaders think about uh, a whole different slew of different issues. And I think that's the more optimistic future rather than uh, seeing a world in which, um, uh, you know, they just, it becomes the priority, particularly given everything else that we're dealing with at this moment. A question here from Deborah Stein about renewable energy. Uh, you, you've remarked a bit on that and, and how it's it's been quite resilient during the pandemic. Do you think renewable energy efforts are going to be helped or harmed or perhaps in some ways both uh, by the by the pandemic and the, res the response to the pandemic? Well, I think it's a mixed mixed at the moment. I mean, what uh, one um... One part of the renewable energy mix that isn't doing very well is biofuels. I think this, the, the collapse in the airline uh, industry worldwide has taken a big bazooka uh, to, to biofuels. So that's going to be interesting to watch. Um, you know, in the United States, there's this constant sort of like <clears throat> false narrative around, well, you know, we've got to protect the jobs in, in, in the sort of fossil fuel sector. And we keep talking about the 50,000 jobs in the coal mining sector, or in coal sector. Um, there are many more jobs in renewable energy. There's like 450,000 jobs, I think. And, and some of those have been lost. So 17,000 jobs were lost in March and April in Massachusetts in the uh, renewable energy sector alone. Uh, as Massachusetts and the Northeast of the United States comes back, there's huge amounts of opportunity for really good quality jobs for the long run uh, as we stand up a cleaner energy system. So th this is where, you know, sort of a little bit of government um, short, medium, long-term planning could pay off and of course there's a huge skills deficit in the US and what have we got we've got 40 million people out of work so this is where you would really want to be coming in with thoughts about vocational training education jobs for a sector that has to grow in the future so there's good news and bad news I think in the UK we've just seen uh, I think one of the stories yesterday was uh, some dissatisfaction from the offshore wind industry which is very strong because government seems to be so distracted with COVID and other things that it's not putting the permitting through on the time frame that the industry would like. And that, that seems to be, that's a government bandwidth issue, I think, mm -hmm. I mean, benignly, I mean, unless there's something else going on. And that again is, it seems a little short sighted because you've got pressure on employment, pressure on the economy. If you've got a sector that can keep moving, then you'd want to keep it moving. So I think that, uh, Investors are going to be interested in renewable energy. They're going to be interested in renewable energy worldwide. The prices are right. It is a levelized cost, the preferred sort of investment option now, I think. So government really should be looking at what the policy tools are in recovery packages and then just the regulation that they need in order to let the sector fly. If it flies, it's job rich. Um. We have a question from Nicholas Muller about, which focuses perhaps more on resilience issues. Uh, you, of course, are you aware that Cyclone Ampan recently hit mm -hmm. the the Indian and Bangladesh Bangladeshi coast as uh, a strongest storm ever recorded in the Bay of Bengal? Uh, Nicholas points out that press coverage of it was pretty muted, probably, uh, presumably because of everything going on with COVID. Um, I wonder if you have thoughts on, you know, 
we're, we're facing here in the Atlantic and in the Atlantic region, in the U S we're facing potentially a very strong hurricane season. Um, and that's going to affect not just, of course, the, the, the U S and Mexico, but also some small Island states in the Caribbean. Are we ready for these, for these disasters here in, in the Western U S we're going to be facing a potentially big fire season and people are very worried about how we're going to react to that. How, how are we going to handle these twin disasters coming at the same time? Well, um, I, I don't, I, are we ready? No, uh, <laughs> the answer. Um, uh, and I, I don't really have a good answer other than, other than to say, I mean, it, it, um, uh, I think I can just objectively say that we, we, we've seen a very, um, uh, you know, the, the federal government uh, struggle to mount a, a, um, a, a you know, a, a uh, cohesive response to the, the pandemic. And um, I think, you know, you, you already see questions. I mean, I was uh, on a call with, with public health officials last week where they were discussing, you know, preparations for hurricane season um, in the, uh, you know, in the time of, of COVID. And this is just not, it's not something that they're prepared for. I mean, it's, these are questions that they're trying to answer now and there's just not a, a playbook. So I, I, I think there are more questions than answers here. And frankly, it's, it's pretty terrifying. Can I just say something about the, the, um, the the recent uh, storm in uh, West Bengal in Bangladesh, you know, there's a good news story in there, right? Which is that the death toll was, I think, only around a hundred, or maybe I may have misspoke, but it was in that ballpark. And um, the the fact that it was it was a devastating storm, and the fact that it was obviously there's more property damage and, and uh, inundation and land damage and all the rest of it, but the reason why the numbers are at that level is because of the extraordinary 20 to 30 year history of disaster risk and reduction investment by India and Bangladesh. Um, and so, you know, you know, while the West is distracted and worried about its own COVID response and then uh, other things that are going on, you know, the fact that the loss of life was so little, I think is a factor for, you know, I'm sure not for any of the journalists on this call, but for, you know, for editors who are looking at, you know, how many uh, stories they can run on any given subject. So I, I think that that's, uh, uh, there's a good news story there, which is that you can actually invest in disaster risk and reduction and do well. Uh, um, but um, but I, I don't mean to belittle the, the impact that, that that storm had, but I, I think there is something to that. Uh, yeah, and yeah, it'll, of course, what we don't know is what impact that will have on the spread of the pandemic, yeah. right? People moving around. So I guess we'll find that out in a couple of weeks. It's, exactly. Yep. Yeah. A lot more questions coming in. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so there's questions about the decline in emissions we've seen. Uh, as a result of reduced economic activity. Do you have a sense of which sectors uh, has contributed most to those declines in emissions? Is There's the aviation sector, ground transport, other kinds of economic activity. I mean, any, any sense of which, what is really causing this drop in, in greenhouse gas emissions? Um, so I think that there are, there are sites that you can go to that, that are tracking this in, in fairly significant detail and I know that the International Energy Agency is making big noise about the fact that they're going to have an analysis of this coming out in a couple of weeks uh, but Carbon Brief and others have looked reported on this so I think obviously the aviation sector is a big one there's been a general slowdown in trade and so uh, shipping uh, haulage uh, so uh, and then and then road transportation in general so that uh, is another big then I think there is, um, there's been a reduced uh, energy demand uh, by commercial real estate. Uh, mm -hmm. So then it, you know, we've got building uh, energy uh, demand uh, as a big component as well. So I think those are the, those are the big ones. Uh, the manufacturing and industrial energy demand has also gone down as things have slowed down. But, you know, but power stations are still working, uh, you know, factories are still ticking over, but that has been another uh, big component. 
I think Wartzilla, the Finnish uh, energy company, put out a very nice report about a month ago on uh, year on year, 2019 to 2020, energy demand, reduction in emissions uh, and things like that. And, uh, con you know, basically concluded that uh, energy demand had come down further than emissions, um, that renewable energy had been able to take up the strain. This was a report yeah. on the EU and the UK. Um, and so that, that was, a, a, I think, a nice sort of year on year comparison. Um, a question from Rose Hendricks. Uh, she's interested in making the case for multi-solving or multitasking. Are there ways to address the pandemics that also address climate change? Are good any good examples of recent policies that do this well that we could point to? Or examples uh, that show how this case can be made clearly? Any thoughts on that? Uh, well, well, a couple... I Justin, go ahead. No, please, please. please no, no, ahead. no, please, no. <laughs> well, no, I was, I was just going to say that, I mean, it, I think it is a lot of what we were talking about in terms of addressing the recovery, uh, you know, stimulus packages that can, that can, um, you know, that will fund uh, greening of the economy while also addressing the, the economic challenges. I mean, in terms of actually addressing the virus itself, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe, Rachel, you have thoughts on that. No, I, I, I was thinking there's, I've got two very different answers. Uh, one is that, um, you know, there's, this was going to be, you know, like Justin said, this was at the beginning of the year, this was going to be the year about where climate broke through. This was also the year where we were going to talk much more about the relationship between nature, biodiversity loss and climate, mm -hmm. because while there was going to be climate talks in Glasgow, there were going to be this biodiversity summit hosted by China. Um, and th this is something which has been under uh, explored. It's complex. Um, but, and I think the pandemic really shows that uh, the destruction of nature uh, poses all kinds of risks. Um, uh, and one of those is pandemics, the uh, zoonotic pandemics, but the other of those is the resilience of the planet and the, the natural uh, uh, regulatory uh, system that nature provides us. So I think it, it throws us back into, a, into a, a need to really reflect on policies that are leading to increased forest destruction, land conversion, land use, etc. So we need, we need large uh, scaled uh, projects to restore uh, land that's degraded to afforest and reforest uh, large parts of the world and, and you know how we think about that maybe has been changed maybe public sentiments and public mindsets have changed as a result of the pandemic my second thing was you know i've talked a lot about renewable energy uh, sort of in the developed world um but the healthcare systems of the developing world in particular in sub-saharan africa uh, operate without electricity without without reliable affordable electricity it it was it was an issue that i was working on in my previous role to to stand up uh, renewable affordable uh, so sort of clean, affordable and reliable electricity for health systems. And that would seem to me to be the single most, you know, sensible <laughs> policy innovation and public investment, mm -hmm. private investment anybody could make. I mean, if you've got a clinic and it can't operate, you're not providing any role uh, in, in resilience to COVID-19, but you're not providing any role in resilience of the, of the community to other shocks that might come from, from climate. So, um, you know, go out and support those who are trying to uh, bring uh, rel reliable, affordable, clean energy to clinics around sub-Saharan Africa. Thank but I, I, would, I would just add then, you know, to follow on that, I mean, public health measures broadly, I mean, you talk about air pollution, I mean, even in the U.S., mm -hmm. you know, making people yeah. more vulnerable to respiratory diseases, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's all interconnected. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Rachel, this is probably a question for you from Tracy Keeling. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the IMF is facing a lot of requests from governments uh, for, for loans. The question is, does the IMF and, and the World Bank, do they include climate goals in the conditions they impose on countries for loans and grants? Oh, now, Tracy, we could have a whole webinar on that <laughs> subject alone. Um, yes and no. Um, so the bank, uh, the, work, the multilateral development banks have a, a long list of things that they, they won't invest in. And then they measure the amount of investment in, what, in climate positive uh, action. 
um, but there are a number of um, you know, think tanks, watchdogs, and NGOs that track where the money ends up. And, and when it, when the when the a multilateral development bank gives money to to the Ministry of Finance to use for planning, to use for whatever purposes, there's sometimes that money can actually go to um, you know things which spur the fossil fuel industry or to the fo or to fossil fuel uh, investments. So there's still <clears throat> some public money going into fossil fuels. Um, the IMF, um, so it, it's it's the banker of last resort for government. So it's providing money to to government, not for particular projects and not for particular investments. And there, um, they now are increasingly um, assessing climate risk. Um, as an impact on the financial health of the country and they have a number of different analytical and tests and tools that they use in assessing a country and they're starting to integrate climate into that and they've come out with some fairly bold statements about the risk countries run to their macroeconomic health and their fiscal health if they don't uh, act to combat climate change so Slowly, slowly catches monkey. The, the international financial institutions are integrating climate into their core instruments of analysis. Um, but I hope that as a result of COVID and this incredible economic shock now, and the need really for the, the IMF to be given additional resources in order to be able to help countries that in this moment, again, we could, we could uh, inject a sort of green and clean into, into the sort of arterial system of, of the international financial institutions much more than we've been able to do up to now. So while we're on the subject of international financing, I'd like to raise this question I, I, um, about the financing of fossil fuels. Uh, there was a report that came out, I believe last week from Friends of the Earth and uh, other groups that showed on average, since the, since the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, on average governments are supporting the fossil fuel sector by about $77 billion each year. That's a cumulative number. Some of the leading countries uh, supporting this and supporting uh, the export of fossil fuel financing um, are China, South Korea, Japan, and Canada, surprisingly. Um, ha have you looked into this issue of who is who's continuing to finance fossil fuels and I don't know, maybe what can be done to, to reduce the, the kind of the, the, the spurring of exporting of the fossil fuel sector to other parts of the world? Yeah, so I mean, I just, Justin, I'll, I'll just start off. I mean, I think that, um, so this is, uh, 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 this is, this is policy coherence, right? So, uh, and, and it's coming through an additional test right now. So, Korea has an election in the middle of the pandemic, comes out with its new green commitment, a, a green deal, um, and at the same time, uh, part of the uh, recover, part of the sort of relief program goes to one of the biggest conglomerates in the coal sector, and still uh, the Korean Investment Corporation and the uh, the overseas investment arms of the Korean government. Uh, are ch chasing uh, fossil fuel deals around the world. So the, the, que the question is, will this, will this government finally close down that sort of loophole that they're not gonna build any more coal at home? Okay, but then you shouldn't be financing coal overseas. Same in Japan, where um, you've now got big private Japanese banks withdrawing from uh, the fossil fuel sector. Uh, but you know the, the, the hangover from Fukushima, the move away from nuclear, has uh, you know unleashed you know support within certain parts of the Japanese uh, government and society for fossil fuels, um, and so the question is you know how quickly can uh, JBIC, which is the and, and JICA, the the overseas lending arms of the uh, Japanese government, st stop chasing fossil fuel deals in Southeast Asia and elsewhere, and then domestically will they cut that up? And again, in Japan, there's a fairly you know, pronounced struggle between Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, yeah. Ministry of Trade and Industry, and Ministry of Finance, right? Um, but I think that the, the message from the Secretary General has been absolute of the UN, absolutely clear, stop subsidies, have coherent policy, end this. Um, and uh, we, we'll have to see. 
I would just, I would add, it's an interesting time, I think, from a, uh, an economist would tell you, now is the ideal time to cut fossil fuel subsidies. Now is the ideal time to uh, rethink these support programs. And, um, you know, it will be interesting to see whether, whether the, any, anyone actually follows through on that. But, um, but the coronavirus has given a, a unique opportunity that hasn't mm -hmm. been there before. Yeah. Uh, thank you both. Justin, a question for you. What stories and themes are you focusing on currently during this pandemic, either domestically or internationally? Maybe how it's disproportionately affecting minority communities. Um, and yeah. What, what, yeah, what, how do you think climate reporting needs to improve to help the public further engage on the topic? Well, I'm definitely following uh, stimulus, as I've been talking about. Um, I am, I'll have a story this week about the disproportionate uh, effects on, on, on minorities, uh, looking at the intersection of environmental justice and climate and climate justice and the, the virus. Um, I, I also, I mean, I think the big story I'm working on really is along the lines of my opening remarks, which is why is this moment so important for, for climate, um, trying to convey that. I think I would say, you know, I think that when this all started unfolding, I, I kind of, there, there were some questions that I received, you know, like, well, why, why, why focus on this longer term crisis that's overfolding over the course of years when people are dying now? And I understand that from a, from a sort of gut perspective, but um, just trying to elevate and make clear to everyone the urgency of this particular moment. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to do in, in my coverage. And that's sort of like a, I think a consistent theme throughout, um, uh, you know, what I'm writing these days. Great, thank you. We're coming up to the end of our webinar, unfortunately. We have about just a few minutes left. I, I do wanna give each of our guest speakers uh, a chance to state some final thoughts, particularly on what stories you think journalists should be pursuing. I know we've talked about that a little bit. But I'll ask one more question from the audience from Harry Suryadi in Indonesia. Uh, we, we talked about the stimulus plans. Are there any examples out there of stimulus measures that have already been undertaken that might be a good models? Do we, do we know of anything that's already been at least, I, I don't know, passed or, or at least discussed? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Rachel's probably speak more on this, but I think the EU is the place to look. I mean, they have a comprehensive um, 800 billion US dollars, I guess. Uh, and, uh, you know, it includes everything from, um, you know, it's grants and loans. It includes things like uh, address just transition to help uh, places that are losing out. Um, I think they're clearly furthest along, but I'll let mm -hmm. Rachel take it. Yeah, no, I think just and Justin's right. The only, the only thing I would also add, and it, look, it, it, compared to Indonesia, it's a tiny, tiny little country. But but watch carefully what the New Zealand government is doing, because you know they shut down very very quickly, very uh, strongly. They they're an island. They were able to keep the virus away. They were able to manage it within the manage the the. the breakouts that they had within the country but they've taken that economic shutdown and then used it to pivot so they're coming back with a four-day week they already have a commitment to a well-being budget they're, they they are one of the countries costa rica finland and others are like them that are trying to move the measurement of success within the economy mm. to a measurement of well-being and resilience and i think that's going to be a big story coming out of um of, of the back end of this virus yeah that's interesting I think they're moving towards the example set by Bhutan, perhaps, to have a yeah. gross national <laughs> happiness instead of gross domestic product. Okay, um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone in our audience for asking such great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, um, you know, we, we, but we, we did our best. And, and please keep the questions, keep doing your reporting. It's really important yes. now more than ever. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to, First to Justin, and then to Rachel, to just for a few final remarks, if you have any thoughts, especially on what issues you think journalists should continue to cover. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this and having me. And I'm, I'm so excited to speak to people around the world. I think, um, you know, uh, it is so important to keep covering this issue now. What, what I would suggest, one focus of mine has been to try to find ways 
that climate intersects with everything that we do uh, and every, really every other issue that's happening. And I, and I think that's something to think about, you know, if you can find ways to tie climate to other things that are on people's not mind and explain uh, why it's so important that way, uh, that's a way to keep it in the conversation, keep it relevant uh, and keep people thinking and understanding uh, why this is really important to their everyday lives. So that would be my, my suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so, it's, uh, it's, so it's been really lovely uh, to be here. That, um, and uh, congratulations to all of you for like hanging in there and writing good stories on this issue. I would, um, we've talked a lot about sort of the disruption to the energy sector. I, I think there are a lot of stories around the disruption to the food production systems mm -hmm. and to the food. And that's going to be a big uh, climate story. It is a big climate story as well. And you, you have to ask why are our you know, global food uh, supply chains so unable to, uh, to pivot in the face of this crisis? And what does that mean for their resilience to climate change? So I think there's a whole thing. And that gets people very interested because people are interested about their children's health and they're interested about food. And, and you know, that's where you can really get to climate as well. And then the final thing I think is that we, when we talk about climate, we always end up talking about emissions, or at least in the developed world and in the global north we do. It's often, and I think this is, this is really got to be the moment where we understand our own resilience in a different way. And this has to be the moment where we really understand that these crises fall with, with a heavier hand on those who are most vulnerable within our communities. And that vulnerability is because of the way in which economies have been working and the way in which we have polluted the air and our waters and our land. And therefore, the people who are protesting, the people who are standing up you know, in support of those who are protesting, it, it, we put them in this position, right? So this is, a, this is a crisis of inequality and how climate has caused that and how climate will exacerbate it, if not arrested, is a really important question. I mean, the fact that the Navajo Nation is dying faster than anybody else, and yet the and, and indigenous people have been the ones screaming about climate change, that environmental justice activists have been screaming about bad air, you know, long before many others. You know, there, there is a, a, a moment here where enough is enough, and that is a climate story too. Very good point. Thank you very much, Rachel and Justin, for your participation. Thanks to everyone out there for joining us for this webinar. Keep doing your reporting. It's really important now more than ever. And we hope to, you know, see you again on future EJN Earth Journalism Network activities. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there.